All right, hey guys, uh, here's what we're up to today. I'm super excited to introduce uh, one of the best estate planning attorneys that I found here in Las Vegas, and, and that's Valerie Del Grosso of Origins Legal Group. Thanks hey, for having me, Andy. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, thanks for coming on. I know we've been trying to plan this for a while and really happy that we're able to, to connect. Uh, well, first, a little background about where are you from? Born and raised here in Las Vegas, actually, although my family came here just uh, three months before I was born from Niagara Falls, New York. So a lot of Western New Yorkers here in this town. That's that's right. And how did your family end up deciding to, to move to the greatest city in the world? Well, I think they were sick of the winters for sure and just looking for a little bigger city experience. And it turned out that my uh, dad and his cousin started a flooring contracting company. And of course, getting here in the 80s uh, was a good time if you were in the construction business. And so things blew up and the rest of the family came out and the rest is history. Terrific. Well, I'm, I'm glad you guys made it out. And for our friends out there, uh, so everybody knows we're going to jump into the important education topics of estate planning, trust, and probate. So, so let's dive in. Well, well, first, Val, how'd you get into law? You know, um, I think growing up, I just saw my family being business owners and saw that usually people are in business for taking steps in their personal life that matter to them, mm -hmm. big transformations, solving big problems they almost always have a legal component. And I tuned into that at a really young age and I decided to follow that actually. Um, I went to school here at UNLV for undergrad. I went to Pepperdine in California for law school. And I was so excited to get there that I started law school at uh, just 20 years old. Came out in the midst of the recession, which meant a lot of real estate uh, craziness happening at that time and novel issues for Nevada. So it was a tough time, but also it was a really great time to gain experience um, that comes in handy today, working in probate and estate planning, uh, where there's always real estate issues, usually. Well, that, and, and that's 100% true. I would, I would agree. How, it sounds like you, you had some business background. How did you be directed into probate and estate and, and trust stuff? Yeah, so I always wanted to work with business owners just because of my family background. And because I came out of school during the recession, what ended up happening is I went into litigation. And yes, there's business elements to that, but um, there's a lot of downsides to doing litigation. Mm -hmm. It's fighting over things that are done and gone, whereas I had wanted to work with business owners who are building things. And so as the market kind of stabilized, um, I was able to get back into that type of work. And what I found routinely is that these business owner clients were coming to me for asset protection. They were coming to me to say, hey, you know, there's a situation happening with my family. Somebody passed away. You know, people are fighting over this or that. And it just naturally grew into this realization that these very foundational personal legal areas should be covered for people. And that's the estate planning. And the more I started to do that, the more I realized how many misconceptions most people have about the need for this. The fact that they don't realize there are so many lifetime benefits to doing it. And it just grew into my main practice and is a super rewarding way to still work with business owners, but also take into account, I come from like a big, annoying Italian family, all that I know about family dynamics and kind of marries it in these, in these practice areas. Well, I, I, thanks for sharing that. And, you know, you mentioned business owners and asset protection. So is, is that who should get an estate plan or? If you want to decide who makes decisions for you in case of an emergency, if you want to decide who handles your affairs after you're gone, and if you want to decide who gets your stuff after you pass away, you need an estate plan because a lot of people don't realize you already have a plan. It's just one that the state has created for you if you're a person who didn't create your own. So the state has already decided who the decision makers are for you in case of an emergency. The state has already decided, it's written in the state law, who gets what of your property after you die. So if you want to opt out of those decisions that the state legislature made, you've got to have a written estate plan. And that's true whether you have $10 or $10 million. So it sounds like the consequences of, of not having a plan uh, would be that the state or the government would get involved. And you know, I don't know anybody who necessarily loves the government or, or getting involved in, in their lives. Any other consequences? The plan that the state has set up for you requires a judge to get involved. And so that's where you hear this terminology of probate. Very practically speaking, when you're gone, you're not available to sign a deed 
to transfer your house to your kids or your spouse. Someone's got to sign that paperwork. And if you don't have a written plan, and in particular a trust, that's going to be a judge. And the thing is, because the vast majority of people have not created a written estate plan of their own, the plan that the state has created has to apply to so many different life situations and family dynamics that it's a very clunky and time-consuming and expensive process, totally avoidable by having your own plan, by the way, that really doesn't work well for any specific scenario. It's a little clunky and time-consuming and expensive for almost everybody. I, and I, I have definitely experienced that for some of the cases that, we, that we've worked on. Can you share maybe some, some real challenges that some, some real families have had, had to go through be, because they decided and didn't have a plan? Yeah, absolutely. So two come to mind um, just right off the bat. The first is that um, a lot of people don't realize that the surviving spouse doesn't automatically get everything. What the surviving spouse gets is dependent on like four different factors, including what they had at the time of marriage and what they brought into the marriage, the value of the, the estate itself, whether there are children or parents or siblings of the person who died. And so it could come as such a huge shock to surviving spouses who are already grieving that now they're going to have to sell their marital home and split it with a, with a sibling or with children from a prior marriage. Totally mm -hmm. avoidable. But you've got to have the written plan. The other area that um, could come really shocking to people, and that's heartbreaking for us to have to deliver the news, is that Nevada law does not recognize non-traditional relationships. And what I mean by that is, you know, we have people come to us and they say, we were together for 30 years, but we weren't formally married. Hmm. You get zero. Wow. You know, we have people who say the person who died is the only father I've ever known, but he didn't formally adopt me and he didn't have a plan. Wow. You get zero. So if you have relationships that are your chosen family and not your blood family, and you want to take care of those people, you've got to have it in writing. And I could go on and on with examples that would surprise you. But yeah, and, and maybe we'll, we'll share a couple more later. So, you know, we've, we've mentioned these words, trust, estate planned. Uh, what, 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 what exactly does that mean? What, what's included in whether it's a will or a trust? What, what exactly does that mean? Sure. Yeah. It's not just one document. That's for sure. For any kind of plan, uh, what you're going to have are documents that appoint decision makers in the case that you can't speak for yourself during life. Mm -hmm. So with a healthcare decision, that's going to be done through a healthcare power of attorney. That's number one. For any kind of financial matters where you cannot speak for yourself, you're going to appoint agents and decide what type of power over your affairs they have, and that's going to be done in a financial power of attorney. Those are critical for anybody. Even if you have zero assets, you're going to want those healthcare powers of attorney and financial powers of attorney. The alternative to those documents is that in case of an emergency where a decision has to be made and you are not capable of making it yourself, your family has to go to guardianship court. So now it's a crisis and they've got to run to court. Costly, time consuming, totally avoidable and brings a lot of scrutiny to the decision makers. And so it, so the answers to these potential problems or issues are included in, in these documents. Is this right? is one of the huge lifetime benefits of estate planning is having those powers of attorney to avoid court proceedings during your life. So that's just very basic, fundamental. You want to have the powers of attorney. Now, if you want to identify decision makers and people who will take care of your affairs after you've passed away, and you want to dictate who gets what, you want at a minimum a last will and testament. A lot of people are surprised to find out, though, that a last will and testament still requires probate court. What do and the you, reason why, hold on, because I hear all the time I meet with people, they say, oh, I have a will, I'm, I'm good. Or I mean, what does it mean? Well, it means that the, the person who has to sign documents to liquidate bank accounts, to authorize the sale of a property, still has to be vetted by the judge. And the reason for that is last wills and testaments are kind of a, an archaic legal instrument. We still use witnesses instead of notaries or sometimes in addition to notaries. Um, 
the will gives all of the family, not just the people who are listed as a, as a recipient of a gift, an opportunity to come forward and say whether the will is valid or not to begin with. Hmm. So there's a whole vetting process. Once that, that vetting process is done, the court will then say to the executor, the person in charge, you can go out and take certain actions, but I, the judge, still have to approve those actions. Everything is done with the supervision of the court. That's just how wills work. So we always do a will just in case, because sometimes there are reasons it's needed, which I'll come to in a second. But if you have any kind of substantial property, anything really over 25,000, especially real estate, you're going to want to have a trust instead. So, so I've heard you mention, I think, like four or five documents, the power of attorney, last will and testament. There's a few different things and now trust. So what's help me understand or help our friends out there understand that, uh, I guess, what are, are all of these are included or what do we need to do? They all work together. So going back to this point that if you're gone, very practically speaking, you're not available to sign over your house or to liquidate your bank account and give it to whoever you want to leave it to. We need someone to sign. If you don't have a plan, it's the judge. If you have a will, it's someone you appoint, but the judge is gonna oversee them. A trust is different. A trust is a contract. It's a promise between you and someone you've decided to be your trustee that they can sign on your behalf when you're not there. So the nice thing about a trust is that you bypass that whole court proceeding, but you get the same outcome. Everything goes where it's supposed to go, you have someone in charge to make decisions and, and take care of the practical steps of signing the documents, but there's no court supervision or oversight required. This dramatically reduces the time it takes, dramatically reduces the cost that it takes. And for most people, especially with real estate, um, those two things are incredibly important to the people who are going to inherit. So the trust is really the way that you want to go. But we still always do a will just in case there's assets that don't end up in the trust. And we always want those powers of attorney because they address lifetime disability issues. Great. And, and you mentioned uh, having a, a judge in charge or going through the court process. And I, I think we understand that as, as probate. Is that kind of what you're referring to? That's exactly it. Yes. And you mentioned a couple of different things, the time involved. And uh, why would it be so important for, uh, for our friends out there to avoid probate? I think the best way to think about probate, it is a totally avoidable process where your family pays again to get things that already rightfully belong to them. What I mean by that is for most people who have pretty straightforward family situations, let's say, you know, I wanted to go to a surviving spouse and then to the kids, that can be accomplished with almost no effort at all except you do have to go and meet with your estate planning attorney to make sure it's documented that way. So let's take a, a very average scenario is someone's got a bit of money in the bank and a home and they want that to go to their children, let's say. Now we have no idea what financial situation our children are going to be in at the time that they're inheriting from us. We hope it's great. A lot of times though, it's not great. And so you have these children who now have to come up with money who may be living in the house with the parent and the parent dies. They can't keep up with mortgage payments. Now they've got to wait to even have the opportunity to sell the property. They've got to have some money to get out of the house, move somewhere else so the house can be sold. It creates this cascade of problems. Mm. And even for those children or beneficiaries who are in a better financial position, they still have to go through this lengthy process and pay you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands, when there's real estate involved to get something that really at the heart of it could just be transferred with a $50 recording fee wow. if so, there were a trust. So, okay. So, so there's people out here and, and we both know going through this process that are spending, are costing their families or the families are having to pay out thousands or from the uh, estate proceeds, tens of thousands, when it could have been just a, a much simpler figure, 50, a hundred, much, much less than that. If, if I guess documents, things were just handled in the right way. Is that right? Ahead of time. That's it. You pay nope. a little bit now to get that plan in place. And it's almost nothing in terms of time or cost later. And Val, I'll, you know, I'll share with you. Um, people who know me you know, may say I'm a, a little cold, uh, but I'll, I can, I can share this. It, it really, and no BS, uh, it breaks my heart uh, to see what some of these families go through. There's a, 
uh, a file case last year, a lady named Janelle, uh, she, you mentioned surviving spouse earlier. Uh, her husband had passed is, you know, he was, they're both young. It was just an accident. And uh, it was, it was really tough. Not only, you know, the stress uh, for her to go through on her own here in town, the rest of the family's out of town. Uh, you mentioned the cost. Uh, we know there's a big cost of having to go through the probate process. Unless a person is a professional legal person, I don't think anybody wants to have court or judges in their life. So ultimately, Val, what's the bottom line? How do we avoid it? What, what exactly do we need to do? Very specifically, you need to think about who can you trust to make decisions for you in case of an emergency. And I don't just mean that they're trustworthy to handle your money properly. What I mean is they know what you would want to do. They could, they would be able to, to assume and fulfill what your real wishes are. Think about who you want to get what. If God forbid the worst case scenario happened and you were gone tomorrow. With just that start of simple information, you can call an attorney, and have an appropriate estate plan drafted. I'll tell you, and, and I don't mean this on, as a knock on my colleagues, but there are many law firms when you call that they will send you, you know, a 25 page intake packet. Hmm. And it's my philosophy that I want to make this as easy as possible for you to get done because a done plan is much more effective than the plan that never got done, but would have been amazing if only my client filled out 25 pages of unnecessary information. <laughs> right. You know, when you're calling around, you don't want some bargain basement person because there's a lot of trust litigation when it's not done right. Hmm. This is a time in life. You're not looking for a bargain. You're not looking for a shortcut. This is not a DIY endeavor. This is a thing to do it right, to get it done right the first time, but you don't need to fill out a 25 page intake packet either. Sure. Well, maybe and in, in, maybe what you just mentioned is why it's been such a challenge for so many people out there to, to get this process done before uh, the inevitable happens. Because I think for all of us, really, our estate plan is we're just going to live forever. And unfortunately, <laughs> that, that, that just doesn't happen. Uh, and from my experience as the real estate guy, with over, I've, my research has shown over 90% of property owners. Uh, do not have that asset or their assets, whether it's houses, office building, whatever it is, uh, it's, it's not protected. So why else? What, what are the reasons people just don't get this done? I definitely think that um, this concept that it's not needed for them, minimal understanding of why it's important and how it can benefit them during life, distaste for talking about death and these topics mm. is a big one. But at the end of the day, I get it. It's not the most fun way to spend your time to go book an appointment with a, a local lawyer, but really with maybe two hours of time to provide information to the attorney and come to the signing appointments, you can have it done and the, the value is immense. I did want to point out the figure of the 90%. We actually recently looked at a, a senior retirement community uh, just within driving distance of our office here. And we found about the same amount of, of homes that are not in trust. And the reality is a half a million dollar house, which, you know, especially in today's market is not, uh, we're not talking about a mansion or talking about rich people. That's a very common price point for a home. Uh, you could be looking at 13 to $15,000 in a probate case. And so when you look at a community of a thousand homes and 900 of them don't have trust, think about the money that's going to definitely eventually end up in the hands of local law firms. I know people don't like judges. I know people don't want the state deciding things. And I know they're not trying to line the pockets of lawyers, but they're not taking the step forward. We got it because I need an answer. I, I want to hear your answer about this. So one of uh, uh, our clients was, I worked with Jennifer a couple of years ago on a probate. I won't say his name here, but he, we went through the entire probate process and I'm telling you, it was a pain in the butt. It, it was a long time because we, it was during COVID and it was just painful for, for everybody involved. And so at the end, I, I ask him, I say, hey, you know, do you think it's a good idea for you to, to go get a trust now? You know, why don't you call, call Jen and Val and, and why don't you get this done? So you, your family, nobody has to go through this again in, in your family. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll get it done. I'll sure I'll, I'll give him a call. Well, do you want me to, I'll tell them to call you. I want to make it easy for you. I want to make this as easy as possible. Yeah, yeah, we'll get it done. Um, I don't think he's got, <laughs> I don't think he's gotten it done. I'm sure he hasn't. Uh, so what can we do? We, I think we're aligned in, in our values. We, we, uh, we want to help people avoid this probate thing. 
how can we help our, you know, our friends and neighbors in the community to, to protect, protect themselves? It's a wonderful question. And it's uh, one that I, I think about basically every single day, because um, as I mentioned before, we started this conversation, I would love to only do estate planning, mm. but I spend 80% of my business doing probate mm. because people did not get around to doing the estate planning. Even as a person who's getting paid to do it and who loves the families that I work with and, and there are elements of it that are rewarding, there's still this feeling of like, I am part of this process that is time consuming and costly for people and totally unavoid, you know, totally avoidable. So right. I think telling people, you know, putting really concrete figures on even a fast probate is about nine months, but there's actually no time limit on how long it can take. That's a big one. You know, as I mentioned, a half a million dollar house could cost 13,000 to probate. That's, that's a big cost. That's mm -hmm. a, a number you can say it's way less expensive to do an estate plan than to burden the family in the future with this amount of money. Letting people know that even if your relationships are estranged, they're still going to inherit. Even if you have already helped someone a lot during life, they're still going to inherit. If they are the closest person to the world to you, but they're not your child or your parent or your legal spouse, they're not getting anything you know, that's important for people to know. I think it's an education piece about the very specific benefits. And Yeah, and that you're absolutely right. And, you know, I just thought earlier, you had mentioned litigation, uh, that you had been, in, uh, you know, have some background in, in business litigation. Uh, what about litigation in, in probate? And and I, I guess what I mean by that, not everybody some, gets along sometimes when it comes to the family wealth or when someone passes away. Do you, can you share a story or two about some litigation issues that, that you've had to help navigate through? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of times people will come in, especially older men, I notice, and they'll say, all of that sounds great, but just they'll figure it out amongst themselves when I'm gone. <laughs> Where my family situation, it's so simple. I just want to keep it simple. So in the name mm -hmm. of keeping it simple, you know, they'll, they'll leave everything to one person and say, oh, they'll know what to do. Mm -hmm. Well, the law doesn't require them to do anything except pocket all of that, you know, but the biggest one is in the name of simplicity, they'll say, just split everything between the kids. And so time comes, everything's to be split between the kids and the kids do not agree on whether the house should be sold or kept. They end up, let's say there's two kids, this specific case I'm thinking about, the two daughters end up on title and then years go by. And one wants to sell and one doesn't. Mm. And of course, between them now, they've done all sorts of complicated financial situations. Who paid the mortgage, but who was living there and who made improvements, but who did unnecessary wear and tear. And now nothing between them is in writing. And so now the two sisters are suing each other because this house should never have been titled in the names of two people. There should have been wow. instructions about what's to happen. So um, even in straightforward family situations, you cannot believe the things that people get into trouble with. And I'll tell you one quick funny story. Uh, every Friday is probate court. And I sat through the whole session one week. I watched five attorneys, one for each of the five siblings, fighting over an Afghan blanket and a Neil Diamond CD. <laughs> oh my. I'll never forget it until the day that I die. Spending wow. $1,500 per hour combined or more probably. Uh, having a fight over these things that no one would have dreamt, wow. you know, the kids would be fighting over. So um, you can trust your people, but it's just better to have a plan in place to avoid wow. that sort of thing. An, an Afghan blanket. But what are some other things people out there should avoid uh, or what questions should they ask and, and they'd be able to figure it out? Yeah, I think if you're um, going to be looking for an estate planning attorney, it makes sense to talk to some people just to make sure that they are aligned with you. They have a good sense of what your goals are and what your family situation is. And you'll know, it's, it's almost like a bedside manner with a doctor. Mm. There are people who are just going to go through the checklist and, and move you through the process. And then there are the people who are going to take the time to understand your situation and what you want and to make sure that what they're drafting for you fits that. And for me, the mark of a really great estate planning attorney is someone who can articulate to you, these are the lifetime benefits of doing this based on your situation and what I think you're articulating that you want. This is how this is going to practically work after you pass away. And they can point out to you different things about, um, you know, even who to select as a decision maker. Like, for example, in our office, we tell people, 
the, the child of yours, let's say, who's the warm and fuzzy one, maybe is not the one who's going to pull the plug like you want. You know, <laughs> we've got to connect to what you want and what they're likely to do. Hmm. And it's just that those softer factors, um, some of which come from doing guardianship and doing probate. So we see that. But just like a very common sense approach to how is this going to play out and who are the players in your life that are going to carry it out? And let's make sure it's it's the right ones. Perfect. Well, I appreciate you sharing, Val, and uh, and thanks for coming on. What's the best way for our friends out there, anybody watching this, to be able to connect with you and, and maybe schedule an appointment? Yes, definitely. You can visit the website at originslegalgroup.com. Uh, you can also call our very friendly receptionist, Alexis, at 702-850-9002 to book an appointment. Um, you'll either have a consultation with me. I've been in practice here since 2008, so it's been quite a while. Uh, or you'll have an appointment with Jenny, my colleague, who has been in practice since 2004. Perfect. Well, you know, we'll be sure to put that in the chat notes. And uh, thanks so much for everybody watching. If this content helps you, uh, please give us a thumbs up. That lets me know that we're doing something right. And and leave any thoughts, questions, anything in the comments. I will absolutely be sure to respond. And in future videos, you know, we're going to go into more details about protecting families and preserving wealth. And we'll see you next time. Thanks.